Hello, I'm Jen Weed, Vice President of Education for CCIM Institute. Welcome to CCIM Institute's webinar, Leveraging Corporate Earnings Reports for CRE Analysis. Joining us for today's discussion are CCIM Institute Chief Economist, Casey Conway, and moderator, Eddie Blanton, CCIM Institute's 2020 President. With the last of the current corporate earnings statements trickling in this month, Casey is taking a deep dive to look past the numbers and share what these reports have to say about the future of commercial real estate and what practitioners should be considering as the economy begins to open back up. Please feel free to ask questions throughout and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of the discussion. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to help with you. This recording and the slide deck will be available after the session. And now I'll pass it off to Eddie to begin. Hey, good afternoon or good morning or, or whatever time it is where you are. My name is Eddie Blanton, 2020 president of the CCIM Institute. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar today. Wanted to say that the last of the latest corporate earnings statement recently came in. There's a wealth of information in them. But did you know that there's also a wealth of info that can directly impact the way professionals do business? KC is here today to take us through these statements, to share his insights and to teach us how to fish. That is where we should be looking in these sometimes overwhelming corporate earnings statements for those golden nuggets of data. And more importantly, how to interpret that data into meaningful insights for commercial real estate. Thanks for joining me today, KC. And congrats on your recent honorary CCIM designation. Thanks, Eddie. I'm, I'm truly humbled as I shared with, with you and uh, Greg Fine and Barbara Crane when you shared the news with me, you, you finally figured out a way how to make an Irishman speechless. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm truly honored in that. I just had a couple of quick thoughts at the beginning. You know, one, Eddie, I want to really thank you, Greg Fine, all the CCIM leaders and, and directors through this period because you know, it hasn't been an easy time to, to go through all this stuff. And when you think about, do I ever get real value out of all of my dues that I pay? I, I would strongly argue that this is gonna be one year we're all gonna be very, very happy to pay our dues because all the things that you guys have done to step up and cross pollinate with other industry associations has been tremendous, making us an essential service with the governors, working on 1031 exchanges. You guys have not missed a beat at all. So even though we haven't seen you a lot, we, we know that the uh, gone fishing sign on your door doesn't mean you've just been looking at the earnings. You guys have really been doing a lot. The, the other thought I'd like to share is a good friend and good fellow CCIM, Jim Baker, as you know, wrote a, published a book at the end of last year titled Confessions of a Commercial Real Estate Broker. I keep it on my desk and I look at his daily uh, item and inspiration. And I just thought I'd share with you, it's very appropriate for today. Do you know what May 28th is in, um, in Jim Baker's book today? Mm. So the, uh, the, the quick answer is, what should I have done differently? Like if you just understood earnings reports, but we're gonna make y'all fishermen today. So thank you, Eddie. Thank you for all that you and the CCIMM leadership has, has done and and uh, I'm very humbled for the uh, honorary designation. Thank you. And yes, you're welcome. And once again, congratulations. Uh, it, it is our honor to give you that. And um, and we appreciate having you on board with us and, and being able to share the pen. So Casey, what made you even decide to start looking past the numbers on these reports for industry insights? <laughs> so, so great, great question. Um, so I'll share with you if you want to advance to the uh, kind of the next slide. You know, part, part of it, I would say, was inspired by what your home chapter, North Carolina chapter, had as its kind of inspiration quote of the day back on May 14th. And it's this quote by um, Ziad, um, uh, the president and CEO of Black Hawk Partners, a private equity group in New York. A great quote. It was, you know, starts off, life is like a camera. Focus on what's important, capture the good times, and if things don't work out, take another shot. So I'll reinterpret that in the red shoe language, red shoe economist language. Focus on what's important means go beyond the headlines. What we're gonna do today, dig into the earnings, see what someone is telling us, what's really important. Is sometimes you gotta dig into the nuggets. Capture the good times. That's my uh, kind of um, first kind of theme during this whole thing, which is look up and forward. You know, we all want to get out of the cave. We all want to get out of the dungeons. We don't want to go backwards. So, you know, go forward and capture those good times, look up and forward. And if things don't work out, that's the what if thinking. 
things aren't going to work out. Things are going to be challenging. But if we engage in what if this, what if that, we'll know the right fork, uh, right direction to take it, a fork in the road. And the last one, just take another shot. Boy, does that not embody adaptive reuse and the leadership that the CCIM Institute has had around adaptive reuse. So that's my interpretation of the great quote. But, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, Eddie, and I've always tried to find, when you look at forecasts, you know, we're all kind of like Winston Churchill. We, we recognize that God didn't give us the ability to foretell the, the future because we just couldn't handle knowing how things are going to turn out and what day we're going to die <laughs> or how much we're going to lose in the stock market and whether our 401k will ever make it to what we need. Um, so kind of quit trying, but it doesn't mean that the good Lord doesn't give us the opportunity and clues along the way to know which direction to go to fork in the road. And I, it's the earnings that have always helped me over the past decades to really understand what companies are doing. Those earnings are what will tell us uh, far in advance of what, what we should do. Great. I tell you, we are in an ever-changing industry, that's for sure. So speaking of the headlines, let's start off with the top headlines you gleaned from these latest reports. Don't give away the story behind each one of them just yet. Just hit me <laughs> with the headlines, please. Yeah, so we'll start off. The, the new normal is behavior analysis. The headline there is, we know most of the companies have quit giving forward guidance. Uh, it's just too uncertain to do it. So instead of, if they're not gonna give us a roadmap, we're gonna have to look at what they're doing. What's their behavior? Um, so we're, we're all gonna become part psycho behavioral psychologists. We'll talk about that. Um, you know, the. The next one, a pretty interesting time to throw some bait in the water. This is a question all of us as CCIMs are going to receive. We, we do a lot of transaction work. We manage assets. We advise clients. And they're really asking, should I bail? What should I do with this property? What should I do with that asset? And so we're going to talk about what's in these earnings that help know us. When's it time to put some bait on that hook and go fishing? Um, COVID-19. You know, this is somewhat trite, but it is changing everything. But let's go beyond the everything and let's look at specifically what? And the zooming to the suburbs, you know, this is one of the big debates that we're going to have is have we just temporarily left the cities and gone home to our suburbs? Or are we going to go back to the cities? And there's some interesting things that companies are telling us already about that debate. And then the last one, we've talked about retail evolution, but we need to look also at hotel evolution um, and accelerating, you know, beyond just the logistics. I, I wrote a piece um, that published yesterday called the other l &T industry, the leisure and travel. So it's not just the logistics and transportation, but it's the other one. So we're going to dive into each of these with your help, Eddie. All right. Well, we're here to help, that's for sure. And a couple of those topics are, are definitely dear to my heart. So, okay, now let's go through each of them. Tell us what it means for commercial real estate professionals and how to apply these insights in our day-to-day. -day. Let's start with your first insight. The new normal is behavioral analysis. Yeah, so uh, we'll, this is a quick slide to show you some of the companies that we're going to talk about, but we're going to cover about 10 or 12 companies. But let's look at this first one. So as I mentioned in the beginning, is companies suspend their forward guidance? Be honest with you, I'm hoping they never give it back to us <laughs> for two reasons. Number one, the robotic traders on Wall Street don't know what to do unless they're told the numbers. They only know how to do algorithms and numbers, so they don't know how to do behavioral analysis and, and understand what companies are doing versus the numbers they're putting forward. So we're going to really have to, um, to look at that, and I'm really delighted to see the lack of forward guidance because we, we really have to go back to old-fashioned, um, put, you know, put the shoes to the pavement and figure out what's going on and talk to people. There are only two companies that I noted of any significance that are still giving forward guidance. And those were Pepsi and Pfizer. Um, so Pepsi is a unique story. They're not, um, a lot of their plants are automated. They make things like Fritos chips and soft drinks and whatnot. They're highly automated, so they don't have as much of a worker risk um, uh, in terms of outbreak. And then Pfizer, a pharmaceutical company. But other than that, everybody else has quit. So here's my recommended formula to capture the behavior. So. It's one part, just quit looking for forward guidance. You're not going to find it. Um, it's too uncertain. Companies aren't going to give it. They're not going to post something filed with the SEC under penalty of perjury and going to jail <laughs> that they have to back, back, you know, walk backwards. Second is one part psychology. So this behavioral analysis is go back to your early 101 psychology class that you had to take in, in college and start looking at behaviors. So as you look at these earnings and you look at what companies you know, are, are doing and they're telling us in their earnings, look at the behavior mechanisms like they've suspended um, 
you know, CapEx, or it's look beyond just their suspended, you know, stock buybacks. Look at what they're what they're doing. We had a great win from Dollar General this morning. We'll talk about on the retail side. And I know you don't like to talk about retail at all, do you, Eddie? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> we're gonna draw you in, man. We're gonna hook you in, and we're gonna bring you all the way into the dock on that one. And the last one is one part testing. So I really emphasize this. Whenever I look at these earnings and I see a behavior mechanism and something that I really think oh, that's an aha moment, I step back and I want to test it against economic or property level data. So, you know, look at other metrics that might confirm if you think, for example, companies are going to, you know, close more locations or they're moving to the suburbs. I'm looking for other affirming economic reports and we'll talk about some of those. Great. Well, I tell you what, this next one I've been doing a lot of, you know, with the shelter in place, because being from the Carolinas, I love my oceans, my lakes, my ponds and my rivers. So now yeah. tell us about a, a pretty interesting time to throw some bait in the water. Yeah. So before we go in there, this is, um, you know, I talked about that confirming one part confirming. This is one of those points, um, you know, the, the CRE transaction activity. So if if we think things are going to lock up and that COVID's really bad, one of the things we should be looking for is that investors are pulling back. And so in the upper left corner of this slide, this is what real capitalytics, they do a great job on tracking this, not just in the United States, but around the world. And they showed us that back in April, the early part of April, that we didn't have a big contraction in CRE. So everybody was thinking, okay, maybe CRE is gonna be okay. Fast forward a month and look what we're seeing. We're starting to see our metric and our decline look a lot more like the rest of the world. But when you see these confirming data points, ask why. The why that's driving this for us is not a lack of interest in the CRE. It's this thing called the Pension uh, Real Estate Advisory Association. And PREA has this thing where they've got to mark to market every quarter their assets. And after the first quarter, they didn't have a lot of evidence to show that they really needed to mark these assets down. But now here in the second quarter, the end of the June, they're really going to have to mark these assets down. So hotel and retail might get severe marks. Then they got to reallocate their dollars. And when they do that reallocation, I think is when we see it come back in. So for in the US, the decline in transaction activity has more to do with what our institutional investors are having to deal with in mark to market accounting in the end of the second quarter and less about a lack of demand. Because here's my hypothesis. If you think institutional investors are gonna go deep into bonds yielding less than 1% or stocks that aren't paying dividends, I think you're crazy. We're gonna sell them a bunch of real estate, aren't we, uh, Eddie? Because that's where the yield's gonna be. We're still gonna produce a pretty strong yield, four, five, six cash on cash cap rates. So that's that, that piece I want there. So if we advance to the next slide, we can talk about what you were queuing up on the, on the second point here. Um, is this an interesting time to put our, some bait in the water? So as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the question that we're probably most going to get asked. So you're a CCIM, you've been through all the training, you've seen this rodeo a few times, you know, should I get in? Should I exit? Should I run for the hills? Should I stay at my lake or my hunting cabin? What should I, what should I be doing here? So the key and why I look so much at corporate earnings is corporate earnings telegraph to you. There's close to a crystal ball. They telegraph a good six to 12 months ahead of where the economy and economic data is going to be. So if companies say, we're going to close stores, you're going to see that show up about six to 12 months later. If companies say we're going to move to the suburbs and we're going to lease more office space, we'll see that in leasing and co-star type data six to 12 months later. So if you want to be six to 12 months ahead of where your uh, the market data is and of real value to your clients, then this is one example. I'll give you a great one with um, Weight Watchers. So one of you know again, what's Casey? What are you doing? Did you get fat at home? <laughs> and, uh, and, and not doing your Zoom exercises. My wife's been doing Zoom Zoom, but I've been doing Zoom webinars. I'm getting fatter. She's getting more fit. But Weight Watchers told us something incredibly fascinating in their earnings, and they said before COVID, they did 75% of their their business is face to face consultations with clients in an office park or in a retail center. They said within 60 days, they had pivoted that model to 75% digital, and they saw a record increase in subscribership and the highest customer satisfaction ratings they've ever had by being digital or virtual versus in face-to-face. Uh, -face. And the CEO of Weight Watchers said, you know, it's really got us thinking about why do we need a lot of real estate? And that got me connecting the dots saying, what if? What if Weight Watchers isn't the only one? 
what does that mean for a gym and LA fitness or all these other kind of experiential use users of real estate? So I found Weight Watchers is really one of those good bellwethers to tell me what might happen to experiential uh, retail type users. Um, the other one that I pointed out is, you know, I look around, I try to look around what's going on in my world. You know, the old days where Eddie, we go out and we drive the neighborhood and we drive the real estate and look at who's there and why is this happening? You know, there's no substitute for that. So I kind of do the thing. I walk around my house and I look at what my wife and my daughters and my young son are doing. And I, I found my wife doing Zoom Zumba and she's still writing a check. So the Zoom Zumba instructor has given up her month to month lease in the retail center. My wife is happy as a clam with Zoom Zumba. She doesn't have to change or get dressed up and doesn't have to do a shower afterwards at some you know, foreign you know, facility. So she's ecstatic, she's writing her check. Um, so there's another one about what could mean for experiential retail. And then at night, I find while I'm working on a webinar or a content piece, the rest of the family's doing family night. They're doing virtual gaming. So when you think about all this experiential, could we have, you know, uh, family night top golf instead of a real top golf facility? These are those little nuggets that are coming out of these earnings that um, that can tell us, you know, we're advising a customer is now the time to dump your center that has a bunch of experiential retail, or is maybe now a time that um, to double down and think about adaptive reuse, buying it an opportunity. So. This question we're going to have to answer for our clients to be really valuable is when should I get in? When should I get out? When do I hold them? When do I fold them? What do I do? Sure. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> crazy? I, I, it's definitely interesting times. And, and as you and many on this call have already heard, you know, I talk about we're in an ever changing environment. Uh, today's different than yesterday and tomorrow will be different than today as well. And, and speaking of changing, let, let's keep going on the COVID-19 is changing everything. That really covers a lot of ground. Yeah, so it's kind of trite, you know, everybody's saying, you know, it's change and, you know, they have their theories. So let's look at a couple of things that we kind of already knew. We've already probably figured out that COVID-19 has accelerated e-commerce. So uh, at, at your inauguration out in San Diego, we released the retail evolution paper and we had some forecasts to 2025. And I've been asked, well, Casey, do you need to update that paper? And I said, not really. Just take whatever I said was gonna happen by 2025 and move it forward three years and we're still on track with the paper. <laughs> we'll just <laughs> cross out the 2025 and put 2021. Um, but there's a few things that were really fascinating on the e-commerce that I wanna share because it doesn't mean the end of the physical retail store. So look at the comp store sales that Home Depot and Walmart and Target reported out in the last week or so. Not only did they have strong e-commerce sales, every one of their stores had three to 4% same store sale comp increases. And that tells me the physical store is not dead. dead. It might be that I'm gonna do more order online and pick up, or I still do go to this store. So if you've got shop tenants next to a Walmart, Home Depot or Target, guess what? They still have draw power and they're still growing in the biggest e-commerce experiment that we've ever had. Then this morning, we got an incredible report from Dollar General. So Dollar General, they don't do anything e-commerce, right? It's a store where it's just what I forgot or I suddenly need, and I, I don't want to get out of the car and get the kids out of the minivan and everything else and go in the traffic to Walmart or a Publix or a grocery store. It's how can I do it real quick to my house? I physically go get it. And Dollar General just blew the cover off the ball. It's like your son hitting a baseball, uh, Eddie. I mean, he just knocked the cover right off. And they reported a record same sales store comps increase ever in the history of retail. It was 21% increase in same store sale comps. When's the last time you've seen that in a retail report? It's never happened. So the retail store is not dead. The next one is container store. This is one, you know, I get so excited sometimes at two or three o'clock in the morning when I'm reading these things and no, everybody's asleep. I don't know who to call. I'll have to start calling you more at two in the morning. Is that okay? <laughs> call on, come on. Yep. So the container store revealed something. They said, look, if they were really hard hit, most of their stores are not in caps or not freestanding. Um, they're in line into a center. They're not real conducive to um, order online and pick up. So their CEO said, look, we closed 51 stores during this thing and we're not gonna open them all back up. And as we figure out which ones we open back up or if we have to go through bankruptcy, which stores are we gonna keep and where are we gonna do new leases? They've already written a new site selection criteria and it's called click it and pick up. And so they said, look, if we don't have enough 
area in the front of the store where we can have people pull up in lines and pick stuff up and drive through or a side entry, then we just aren't going to do, we're not going to renew that lease. We're not going to lease that store. And I think every retailer is going to really um, look at this closely um, in terms of your click it and pick up strategy, because not all of them are going to be delivering their merchandise that you order online in a Mercedes van by Amazon. And so I thought that is a whole new criteria and language that we're going to put into our site selection studies that we do. So um, I'm hoping our instructors can can help work with us and and get click it and pick up into our site selection criteria. Um, you know, and then it's about you know connecting this behavior and what it means in terms of think of all our traditional metrics that we had in terms of occupancy cost ratios and how we price things based on density. We had a fire marshal that told us how many people could come into a restaurant, and now we're probably going to have a public health official tell us that we need to cut those numbers by 25 to 50 percent. What does that mean for that business? They if they if they're going to have less revenue, they can't pay the same amount in rent. They can't pay the same amount in rent. What does that mean for all of these ratios that we've been learning over the last decades? I think they're all going to be be changed quite dramatically. And my last example here is Chick Fil A. So you know I love Chick Fil A, and yes, it is largely because I love the the, the minis, um, but they're not quite as good as Smith Family Diner in Greensboro, Eddie. But you know it's it's a good, you can't have Smiths everywhere. But so Chick Fil A is it, but I love it because of their their business savvy. So before COVID. Chick-fil-A was already two years into a program where they were redoing all of their physical stores. And they had realized that, you know, kind of McDonald's messed up with their self-service kiosks and it didn't work very well. And so instead they developed an app that would allow people to more quickly go through the store through drive through but they weren't set up for a lot more drive through traffic. So they decided, let's tear down all the stores. Let's move the store from the center of the pad to the back of this pad. And if it was a site that was only, say, a half to three quarters of an acre, they got rid of those. And they went everything to now almost a two acre pad site. And what they did is they added more drive through so they've got two, three, four lanes. They put in two kitchens. So one kitchen is just for the online app ordering, not to get screwed up with everything else. And they were crushing it. Then comes COVID. And now they're just even more crushing it. And what Chick-fil-A is reporting out and telling me is those new stores that were open before this COVID outbreak, their sales are up anywhere from 10 to 20% because they can do drive-through. So what does that mean? for traditional out parcels with a Taco Bell. You some have some of the smallest sites that you see out there. You, you know, you're the expert on this, Eddie, with restaurants. Um, what does it mean for a subway where you can't drive through? Um, they got to buy the, the store next to them and put a circle drive through through the building. Yeah. Um, so I'd really be curious of your thoughts, Eddie, because you deal with so much of this, but I, I think everything is gonna change and it's more than just more online. It's how we execute and click it and pick up and these things like Container Store. Your, your thoughts as the wizard on retail. Any insights you're picking up? Uh, I tell you, with the, the click it and pick up or click it and pick it, as we call it, um, I'm already speaking to some landlords out there about taking out some small shop space to allow for additional drives, you know, through and around the building just for those purposes. So that the big boxes will have more capability and those small shop tenants that will survive will also have that capability in the future as well. So that that's that's new to me, but we're already having those discussions. Yeah. I think, you know, we're going to supplement adaptive reuse to more productive use. Exactly what you're talking about. How do I make my, the tenants that are going to survive, how do I make them more productive? And I think you're exactly right. What are the innovative ways we think about how to do click it and pick it or pick it up? So you're the, you're the restaurant guru. I, I respect it. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm not sitting on a lot of the former uh, Taco Bells, that's for sure. With, uh, with an <laughs> eight foot or 10 foot drive through. They're kind of eating it right now, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So just to, to kind of continue on, what do you mean by zooming to the suburbs? Yeah, so if we go to this next slide, you know, this is the, well, before we get, we get this good one, we'll just show up. I forget, you know, where we're going here. But um, if just go back one slide. Okay, yeah, we'll go back. Uh, back from the Zoom one, one more. There we go, right here. The fastest growing in retail brands. 
So like we just talked about everything changing. So look at who I found this graphic. If you don't, if you don't know um, Visual Capitalist as, as a site, I encourage everyone to make it part of your daily read. Open Jim Baker's your Confessions of a, a Commercial Real Estate Broker. Look at what the theme is for the day. Then go to Visual Capitalist and, and look and see if there's an earnings report. But this, they do a great job of visualizing information. And this one showed who were the fastest growing retail brands. And so you see that on the left and some of the ones we knew, you know, like the Target and the Amazon and the Walmart and Flipkart, which is part of Walmart. You know, but Lululemon, how many of you think that Lululemon is going to be the leader in the, in the retail brands? I, I don't think anything apparel is, is really going to make it. And then you look on the right and you can really see the apparel, the Under Armour, the um, H&M, and even the Walgreens, the, ph the pharmacy and drug stores, you know, what's going to happen to those. So this should get us kind of thinking about that. So if we go to the next slide. Here's where it really hits home on how quickly things are changing. So on the left, here's this uh, graphic, um, again, visual capitalists um, with Zoom. So this little company named Zoom that a year ago, we were kind of wondering, well, how does that work with GoToMeeting? And do I really need to be seen? I really don't want my boss and my clients seeing me. <laughs> I'm casual at home today. Zoom in less than a year has become a, a company that is worth more than our seven largest airlines in the world. That is mind boggling. And where is the Zoom work gonna be done? How many workers will they really need? Will they occupy office space? Then look at the airlines and how much physical retail space they use at airports. And the answer we use is like rental car companies, like you know maybe Hertz going away and Advantage going away, both in bankruptcy. These are really transformative things we need to be thinking about. And in CCIMs, there's lots of, lots of room for us to be thinking about how this changed. The other one is the fast food, really kind of the Chick-fil-A story thinking of just about how fast food has to adapt. And that, you know, I think many Americans find that, you know, they do a Chick-fil-A or other, the drive-through is a pretty good way to do it. And maybe they don't want to unpack the kids and to go into the restaurant. So I think for casual dining, we're going to rethink how that works, how drive-through works. Do we need as much parking? Do we need as much in-store space? Do we need two kitchens instead of one kitchen? So those are some good changes. So we can go on to the next slide. But those two, I thought, help might put this in perspective. So zooming to the suburbs, you're there, right, Eddie? We're all in the suburbs. Anybody not in the suburbs? <laughs> There's a few still here in the center city. Even all my colleagues, when I connect with people in New York today, they're not in New York. <laughs> they're all gone <laughs> um, out there. So a, f a few things that came out of the earnings that helped me realize this is more than just a theory. It is actually happening. So the first came when DR Horton in their earnings reported. Um, so you think, what can I learn from a ho housing home builder about commercial real estate, you can learn a lot. So DR Horton said, and they shared, their single largest segment of buyer traffic right now is young, young professionals, millennial age, that are renting apartments in the inner city. And while they still have a job and credit and a little bit of cash, they're leaving and not telling their landlord and they're buying a house in the suburbs, entry level, first move up type housing, um, they're already doing it. So when the public home builder says, Grandma and grandpa or baby boomers aren't out here buying it. It's all the people leaving the city. So suburban Atlanta, suburban Charlotte, suburban Orlando, that they're all leaving. And so that's telling us this is probably a, when you move your housing, that's more than an anecdotal. That is a real commitment to um, things reversing. Equifax then connected the dots on office. So Equifax in their um, in their thing, besides the fact I wanted to know how they were how they were screwing with us in our credit reports and <laughs> our scores. Um, one of the things I didn't like was they were they were boasting about their earnings because of the amount of credit inquiries. Everybody that asks for a, a rent forbearance or a loan forbearance gets a credit report check, and that's a negative on your credit report. So they're making a fortune charge in the banks and everybody and the landlords for those, but they reveal something else. Equifax headquartered here in Atlanta, they occupy a lot of square footage in midtown Atlanta and around the city, and they said, we have a new line item we want you to be aware of. It's called redundancy cost. And he said, we know that our employees aren't coming back to work. They're not gonna take public transportation. They don't wanna come into the dense city. They wanna work remote. They've proven to us they can do it, but they do need to get together once in a while. They need to have some team meetings. They might need to meet with a client. And so we're having to rent and look for new office space in the suburbs near where our, our teammates um, reside. So they did a big analysis looking at where they lived. They identified there were three suburban pockets where most of them did. And they put a bid out to the brokerage community to help find them suburban office space. And, um, you know, they're a credit entity. They're gonna pay their, they're gonna pay their lease. 
um, through where it runs out, probably for a few years, just like in the financial crisis. And then when those leases come up, they probably don't renew and maybe they do a bigger commitment to the suburbs. But redundancy cost revelation in Equifax told me there is some very serious demand coming for suburban office space, whether it's redundant or the primary. The other one that I'd point out, you know, in CCAMs, we all have to think about, we probably did a lot of transaction activity last year, and that activity may have slowed down because of what I shared earlier. So what are the skills that I have as a CCIM that I can use maybe in a consulting or advisory way to generate some revenue? And I think property taxes is going to be one of them. We could be an advisor to our local communities. How are they going to plug the hole? Um, next year, everybody that owns commercial real estate is going to be going in for a property tax appeal because of COVID. Um, they may not want to get an appraisal initially because there's not a lot of comps. So they may turn to a CCIM or a broker. Remember the broker opinions of value that we went through in the financial crisis and how valuable brokers were pre an appraisal and a, and a foreclosure. So I think there's a lot that can be done in the skill set of CCIMs around understanding the repricing, the density ratios, all of that are very important. I had an interesting couple of inquiries from law firms in the past week that are taking the position that these new density orders by governments, municipalities that say you can only open up your restaurant with half the density, they're thinking about taking the position that that's an eminent domain. That's a taking without compensation. And they want to know who are the experts they can go to to help them understand how to quantify the damages. And so I immediately gave them CCIM.com <laughs> and, and the website by geography to look at, look at there. And many of you have heard me talk about adaptive reuse. I want to throw one other out there in this debate between city or zooming to the suburbs, and that's college towns. So think about big cities and then think about college towns. They operate very differently. They have different economic drivers. And the college towns, I think, could be some of the most impacted in this whole thing. I'm going to give you some numbers. So we have about 360 MSAs in the country. 136 of them are colleges that play NCAA football. What happens to them? Does the Pac-10 even open up? So, Eddie, feel, feel good. The SEC is going to play football. I don't see Nick Saban in Alabama or anything. They'll play it somewhere, somehow. Vacant stadiums, they're not, they're going to play. Now, Pac-10 and West Coast, I don't think they're going to play. I really don't. So think about these college towns. Their Christmas season was graduation season, commencement exercise season. That three or four week period of time is when their Christmas is because they don't have a Christmas. All the kids are gone home for college or come back home from college. So they lost 40% of their revenue. And now you look at they didn't have summer camps. So all those summer programs are gone. There's another 20% of revenue. And then I have two college age daughters that don't want to go back to college. They both told me, we don't want to go back in the fall. We're concerned. And they want to do on, they want to continue to try to do this online learning or remote learning, at least for another semester or two until they feel psychologically confident that they, that they can go back. I listened to the, um, the Dean of the University of Miami this morning talking about they had just built all these new dorm buildings and were ready to tear down the old ones. And they thought, wait a minute, maybe we keep those and we decrease the density of student housing to get students to come back to college. So a lot of interesting things going on there. We have 136 uh, towns or MSAs that are college just for football. If you look overall, we have almost 200 college towns in this country and they're gonna need a lot of help. And it, just like we think about leaving the city to the suburbs, what is the impact with all the students leaving the college towns and coming home? And what, is, what does that mean for those communities? And so I think it really is gonna boil down to what we've talked about. We did the paper on adaptive reuse. Um, I think it's gonna skyrocket. What do we do with these properties and these, um, you know, these other assets? How do we put them back to productive use? So those are a few of my crazy thoughts. Eddie, you think you agree, disagree? You're going back to college and you know, we could go back now and we can get dormitories on the Jeep, right? Maybe it's time for all the baby boomers yeah. to go to college. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be where we want to go, but you're, you're right. The, the SEC and the ACC are going to figure out football, and uh, and there's a lot of students, including those um, my son's age, that are heading off to college that, that are looking to do the virtual to start with because they don't want to get there and then be sent home. Yep. So this next slide ties in nicely, Eddie, and you can probably relate. There's a couple of North Carolina towns in here. Uh, and one in South Carolina, Hilton Head and, and uh, Asheville. So this was a piece I ran across, um, Zero Hedge, another great source that, that does really deep dive stuff that's free. You can sign up for it. And they looked at what are the, what are the most impacted small and mid-sized metros with the most self-employed workers. And there's a couple common themes. 
one, they're either college or university, or two, they're very substantial in leisure and tourism. And so you have a lot of small entrepreneurial businesses that do catering or they, you know, they have a business that really caters to the tourism or, or other industries. And so when we think about the impact on workforce, imagine our America, imagine Eddie, if we don't, we can't go to Asheville and cool off and play golf. Uh, imagine South Carolina, we can't go to Hilton Head, Santa Fe, New Mexico, a great place, St. George, Utah, winter and skiing. We could see a real change in our landscape and how we travel and where we go because look at where the self-employed workers are most concentrated. And again, these are smaller metros. Um, I, I had a webinar earlier this week with your North Carolina and South Carolina chapters. I said, the good news for the Carolinas is you're a very diversified economy. While you have great tourism in places like Asheville and Charleston and Hilton Head, you, you don't have a lot of markets where your whole economies pivot on this. So when you think about your state and your regional economies, think about this particular element. The self-employed workers are just absolutely devastated in this COVID environment. And I think we have one more on the next slide. Might drive this one in. Oh, well, uh, so kind of here, uh, cue this up, we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the next thing here, number five. Well, just, uh, you know, now that you've covered the, the zoom into the burbs, uh, I agree totally, we're seeing that in my market here in Charlotte and also throughout the Carolinas. And I think we're gonna see more of that in the future. So. Now this next one that you've spoken on before, and you actually wrote a CCIM Institute Commercial Real Estate Insights report on it. So let's close out with how retail and hotel evolution is accelerating along with logistics. Yeah, so I'm going to spend a little less time on the retail. I think we all have it. That was a great collaboration with um, uh Acre and, and CCIM that we did last fall just to, to bring you in strong here in your world. <laughs> but I think we also need to think about hotel evolution. And so I've been looking at a lot, you know, Marriott and Hilton and Wyndham and others. And I published a piece um, with Acre yesterday on what I call the other L and T industry, leisure and tourism and travel versus just logistics and transportation. And we've got to be thinking about how, what is the business model for a hotel? where there's already ordinances in California and in Florida where they're talking about limiting the occupancy to max 50%, that every other room's gotta be empty. They're talking about doing away with things like valet service, no touch, no interface check-in. So we were, some of us were getting used to using an app to check in, but we still had to go to the counter and get a key. That's all being done away with. Uh, how about when you get to your room, it's it's sealed in a, in a, in a Vela wrap type of thing, and you got to cut the wrap to go in, and it's a way to assure you that no one's been into that room since they cleaned it. And then when you get in, you find that the bed's not made, that there's a linens package. You got to make the bed, and you got to put the towels out because it's designed so that no one has touched those cleaned and sanitized um, items. Think about the rental car companies, what they're going to have to do in sanitization. Do they even do they even survive? So Hertz filed bankruptcy, not because it was over leveraged on its real estate, because it was over leveraged on all the cars that it was buying and, and then trying to lease back out that they can't do. Um, so a lot's going to change and evolve in hotels and the business model. You know, and for CCIMs, you know, what's the new, you know, we do all of the financial analysis and the market study. What's the value in the repricing these hotels? where instead of 65 to 80% plus average daily occupancies, now it's max 50 or 60%. How does that model work? What's the price per room? What should the cap rate be? So a lot's gonna change on the hotel side. I think we need to, to really beef up our skills and look at what the hotel companies like Marriott and Hilton are telling us already. The other one is on the warehouse. It's not gonna escape unscathed. I call it logistics 2.0. So just like after the financial crisis, we had CMBS 2.0 to fix what was broken in securitization. We're going to find that we're going to have to fix that in logistics. And I'm telling you, if it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm already know I'm not going to sleep and I've read all of my earnings reports, I go abroad and I look at what the foreign companies are looking. I'm a freak of nature. So I found this one that we've got listed here, Elgi, E-L-G-I. They're an Indian-based company. They're global and they're one of the largest manufacturers of air compressing equipment. And they provide, and it's not just for auto repair shops, believe it or not, in your hospitals, pharmaceuticals, air compression is used in a lot of things in our economy. And they supply the majority of the, uh, the compressors to Australia, North America, Asia, Europe, you name it. 
And LGI said, we're going to tell you how screwed up logistics and supply chain is because we learned it head on. And we found that how we communicated with other vendors around the world to make things come together, uh, how we did shipping when shipping stopped, when we needed to move something, you know, from Australia to North America and the ships weren't moving and the ports weren't open. And so they told us a lot about how far behind we are and what's going to have to happen in logistics. And I think this next slide may provide a visual for us on that, Eddie. Woke me up. So um, this is one that was put out again, visual capitalist. Can you tell I'm, I'm really into the visual of visual capitalist, how we visualize data. And so what they showed us here was they showed what percent of our warehouses are actually automated that have robotic forklifts. All, you know, they're not all, all of our warehouses don't look like FedEx uh, and Amazon and UPS. And what they found is it's just a little over 50%. And then look at cloud logistics. We're not even at 40%. So we know where orders are going so that we can do blockchain and all that type stuff. If you look down there at the bottom, the 49% ratio circled, 49% of warehouse distribution center managers say they still use mostly manual processes. That is going to have to change. And what's going to accelerate it is this thing called supply stock. So we're going to get rid of the just-in-time inventory from the Japanese that they gave us in the 1980s when I was in business school. <laughs> I just dated myself again, didn't I? Um, it, it wasn't just my gray hair that gave me away, was it? <laughs> so um, what, we're, what we're going to find out is we got to deal with supply stock. So where's the additional PP&E, the additional ventilators, the additional toilet paper that we run out at? Where are we going to put it? We're not going to put it in our main e-commerce logistics warehouses. That's the throughput warehouses. We're going to have to put this somewhere else, and it's a new cost, and we're going to want to minimize that cost. So we're not going to build new $200 a square foot e-commerce warehouses to put this stuff. We're going to look for like secondary markets, like how to repurpose an old JCPenney store or an old mall, old mall at Monmouth, the public REIT that I'm on the board with. We were one of the first ones to do it with FedEx on a failed mall in Mesquite, Texas. Amazon recently, one of our great CCIMs there in North Carolina um, that you may know, Karen Mankowski sent me a great piece where they were interviewing um, Amazon and Amazon revealed how they've acquired 23 malls in the last two years, a lot of them up in the Midwest and Ohio and completely converted them to last mile in e-commerce fulfillment. Mm -hmm. We have a long ways to go in redoing logistics and automating. And so um, I think that even warehouse um, is gonna have a ways to go. The box is gonna become a lot more valuable. Uh, FedEx tells us at Monmouth that they're now using our fulfillment centers and our warehouses 24 seven. And they basically said, don't talk to me about cap rate and rent per square foot. I'm looking at throughput per hour and I'm running these things 24 seven. So where I used to run them five days a week, I run them seven days a week and I'm running three shifts or I'm running more and more robots. So the throughput's gonna tell us that we've got to get more automated. And I think the supply stock is going to be a huge opportunity for our secondary markets and, um, and our retail side. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely it does. All right. So, so let me ask you this. Yeah. We, we, have, we have a lot of overlooked sources of really relevant timely data that all of us in commercial real estate should be leveraging. But right now it's time for you to spill the secret KC sauce. So I'm going to put this in a two part question, okay? Where in these reports should we be looking for the data that would apply to our industry as number one? And number two, once we find it, how do we interpret it? Because maybe you probably should use one or two of your points you've made today as a case study example for us so that we can relate to it. Yep. So if we advance to, I think, the next slide here, I'll give away my secret sauce and, and uh, um, you've all heard me talk about transportation logistics, so we'll go beyond this one. Um, this here here we go so y'all thought i was really brilliant and uh you know uh, <laughs> this, this is why you had to give me the honorary designation you gave up hope that i would pass the test right that's right <laughs> so here's my secret sauce and it really isn't that hard so step one you don't have to have a fresh mba you don't have to know how to read financial statements and earnings reports i'm going to give you the cliff notes version and you too can be brilliant um, and now, you know, I'm just an average C plus student from, uh, from Emory <laughs> and, uh, um, maybe now coach Saban will let me stay over there in, in Grayson at, at Alabama now that I've spilled the beans. So step one is select one or two free sources that monitor the earnings releases each quarter. And, um, we'll have the, the graphics on the next slide here, but, um, I'll give you a couple, a couple of three right here. 
So the first, and these are all free. So the first is some of you may have heard of um, uh, Seeking Alpha. So Seeking Alpha, they have a calendar, they pick up things, they give a great summary, they give a link to the earnings call transcript. Stockearnings.com is another one where they have a great calendar and they show you what's coming. And so at the beginning of each earnings season, when you kind of hear it on the business news, they have the whole calendar and you can click on it day by day as they release it and you can go right to what the results were in a summary. The other one though, that I do a lot is I go directly to the company. Um, so I look at what companies, so I have to look at everything, but for many CSAMs, you're gonna look at your geography. You're gonna look at your city or your state or the tenants in your building. So for retail and you, have a Dollar General or you have a container store, you want to be following them and see what happens. So if you go to the, the website in Monmouth, I'm going to pick on them because I'm on their board and guess what? We do a doggone good job with our website. So I go to um, Monmouth, M-R-E-I-C.com um, and Monmouth Reek, they have, I go to the investor relations tab. And at the investor relations tab, not only do they give their that a public release with the SEC, but they'll give you their PowerPoint presentation that they did for the analyst call, and they'll give you the transcript. And if you go straight from the transcript to the Q&A, you can forget having to dig into all this stuff. So those are my three tips, Seeking Alpha, StockEarnings.com, and then go to the, um, the website for the company and go to their investor relations tab. So that really ties in number two, identify those companies in your local market that drive your economy, that impact your buildings and real estate. So kind of put your list together, then look at seekingalphastockearnings.com to see when they come up. And then three, the most important thing I look at is the earnings call transcript. So that's usually posted the end of the day that they have it or the next day. And like I said, I go straight to the Q&A part. You, the SEC makes them have about five pages of stuff that they have to say <laughs> and disclose and all that kind of stuff. Just get past it. Go right to the Q&A. These analysts are smart as the Dickens. They have great questions. You know, uh, they'll ask you about store closings. They'll ask Hertz about who are your debtors. And so uh, Hertz revealed um, our biggest debt is with those that are financing the cars and very little is the real estate. So we're looking for the real estate. Then that distinguished and told me which are the banks that have the real estate debt that I might talk about for workouts. Then step four, like an appraisal, you know, like I said, just don't read the front end and boiler point, go to those Q and A. And the last thing I do is I do what if thinking around the information um, that we've got. So like the container store, when the container store CEO in a question, they were asking him about store closings and how do you pick which ones you're going to close? And if you go bankrupt, which are the ones you're going to fight for and affirm the leases? And he brought up that click it and pick up um, thing. I started thinking, holy cow, that's a light bulb moment for me. That could apply to every retailer, a fast food restaurant. It could apply even to big stores like what Home Depot and Walmart and all of them are doing in their parking lots. And so that was an aha moment for me. And so those aha moments really come out of you know, looking at the Q&A. So pick a free resource. Here's two or three of them. Go to the company's actual website and go to the investor relations tab. Um, identify a few companies that impact your local company or uh, uh, your community and then or in your that are tenants in your real estate. Um, go skip all the front end stuff. You don't need to read these earnings reports. Go to the find the transcript, go to the Q&A part. And then on those investor relations apps, these PowerPoint presentations, they do are great. They have all the graphics, all the things that, that you need. So that's my secret sauce. Say I'm just an average C plus student. <laughs> that's great, Casey. Well, listen, we, I know we're running a little short on time here, so but I do have one quick question that we received. And that is some of the data assumes that the economy is permanently changed versus a temporary problem. Where should we look to understand whether this is permanent or not? Uh, your 30 seconds or less answer on that. Yeah. So again, I look at anything that's a more forward view. And that's why I like earnings. Earnings are telling me the companies are telling us where they're going to be six to, six to 12 months from now. So I look at that. The other thing is I look at anybody that can visualize data, visual capital, zero hedge. I look at those. Um, if you're waiting for just to transactions and comps, you're going to miss the, miss the whole boat um, on that side of it. So um, 
you know, those are some of the kind of the key things that I go look at. And that's why earnings are so important to me. And hopefully what we did today is, you know, we helped you become a little bit more of a fisherman on that, a more of a value add to your clients, to your tenants, to your, even if you're in property management, the more you know about the companies that affect your real estate. And it may not be a tenant in your building, but it may be down the street. Give you an example over in Alabama, I did a piece on all the auto, automobile manufacturing closings. So we had several. Uh, we had Mercedes, we had Honda, um, we had Toyota building a new plant, they got deferred. What do those things mean for my community and what does it mean for my real estate? So um, it's I just can't underestimate or underscore the importance of looking at these earnings. I'll always cover them and share them with you, um, but hopefully you can be a little bit of a fisherman or woman about this stuff today. And then That's don't forget great. the papers. I mean, I want to compliment you and, and the CCM Institute on the Insight Series. You know, we started with Amazon Site Selection. We've done a lot of papers. We were ahead of everybody on adaptive reuse over two years ago, the retail evolution. Um, you guys have really um, helped me focus and you've listened to your to your membership about what are the tools and, and we're the leaders in this stuff right now. They're, they're looking for us. So maybe now the earnings will, will help supplement it um, for you. That's great information. And thank you, Casey, for sure. So before we wrap up, do you have one last piece of advice for CCIMs and other commercial real estate professionals who are out there working the problem? Yeah, so we, we talked a lot about adaptive reuse of real estate. Think of adaptive reuse of your skill set. So right now, we may not be doing as much in transaction activity. So, but think about your skill set. You have a tremendous skill set. You've taken all the courses, whether it's marketing, whether it's um, the financial management, investment management. You have the skills to answer the questions that our clients have today. So think about whether it's property tax consultation or whether it's this aha moment like click it and pick up. What is it that I can share for my client? Um, a lot of our clients and our bank clients are going to need help with loan forbearance. I think we have a big a big problem coming a year from now when all the homeowners come off of loan forbearance. We have 8%, a record 8% that are in loan forbearance. We have the re single record highest increase in mortgage delinquencies. We have 22.5% unemployment. I think that's gonna go past 25%. So it's connect those dots. You know, and I mentioned, not only when I look at these earnings, do I go and look for those nuggets, but I try to triangulate them to an economic piece of information that helps confirm that um, or tell me I'm on the right track. Like declining um, you know, CRE transaction activity, or ask the why question. In the US, it's not because of a lack of demand. It's because the pension institutional money that control two and a half trillion dollars of CRE activity, they've gone to the sidelines until they get past this revaluation to mark to market accounting in June. So it's ask those what if, think about your adaptive reuse skills. You may be doing a lot of different things until we get to the other side for transactions. So be, be confident, reach out to the Institute. What you guys have done with the COVID-19, the ccim.com forward slash COVID-19 is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, and then engage, you know, uh, talk to people, don't hibernate, don't, even though you're at home, I make it a point every day, I've got about 20 calls a day to different industry segments, leaders and people around the country. Cause I, I always re, you know, reinforce to myself, I, it's, it's what I don't know what I what I don't know that I know that's really that's going to bite me, and that's why I looked at these things. So hopefully that's helpful. Not that, very much so, and, and and thank you again for this fantastic discussion here today. Um, that's why you're not only our chief economist, Casey, but you're also an honorary CCIM. And once again, congratulations on that. Thank you. You, so you provide much. forward thinking, innovative solutions like this to help us improve the analysis and valuation of commercial real estate so that, that we can better advise our clients uh, and or firms. And for more of KC's invaluable insights, please be sure to check out CCIM Institute's Commercial Real Estate Insights Series, authored by KC at www.ccim.com forward slash insights. And as I always kind of conclude other things, I just want to say to everybody, uh, at the end of the day, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay positive because we are in an ever-changing environment and an ever-changing industry. And so we will prevail. We will come out stronger. Utilize your CCIM tools and your resources, and it will help you in your day-to-day -day business. At this time, I'd like to turn it back over to CCIM staff, uh, to Jen Wee. Thank you, Casey and Eddie, for your time and expertise. We appreciate the value that you bring to CCIM and the greater CRE industry. And to our audience, 
You can find more online courses on timely topics like valuation, risk analysis, and much more through CCIM Institute's Ward Center for Real Estate Studies. Please visit our web website at ccim.com for more information, and we look forward to seeing you on a future CCIM webinar.